In this video, we're going to look at the kinetic model of gases. And this is the model from kinetic molecular theory that gives rise to the ideal gas law. So I know we discussed the ideal gas law as a combination of the simple gas laws, Boyle's, Charles', Charles and Avogadro's law. But this gives you a little bit more of a physical underpinning of what it means for a gas to behave ideally. Uh, what are the physical assumptions that go into the model of an ideal gas? So here we have a figure uh, that more or less shows us what the ideal gas model is. So basically we have a, a box, right? Uh, this is your gas container. Uh, it doesn't have to be a box. It could be a cylinder. It could be, you know, whatever your gas happens to be in the atmosphere, right? Um, but this is basically our container. And all of these little purple spheres are our gas particles, right? Now there are three major assumptions that go into the ideal gas law. And when you hear these assumptions, um, you kind of think these assumptions are crazy. But that's, the, that's what's so beautiful here about the ideal gas law is that even with these assumptions that physically are easy to disprove, um, we still get a very good model of a gas. And you've already done a lot of ideal gas uh, calculations at this point between general chemistry to now. And so you have an appreciation for how powerful this equation really is. Of course, it breaks down in certain areas and we'll talk about how we uh, model those cases where the ideal gas does break down. But you have an appreciation for the fact that this is a pretty powerful equation. Uh, but the models of the, the assumptions of this model um, are one, that gas molecules are identical hard spheres. Now, obviously, you know that that is not true, right? Um, think of a gas like methane, right? CH4 with its tetrahedral uh, molecular shape, a sphere would actually be a very poor approximation to the shape of that gas particle. Um, but we assume that these gas po uh, molecules are all identical hard spheres, right? Uh, the second assumption is that the size of the molecules themselves are negligible. And this comes from the fact that we use the total volume in all of these equations. So we don't neglect, or we don't account for the uh, amount of space that the gas molecules themselves are taking up. And this comes from the fact that gases are usually more dispersed uh, on a particle level than things like liquids or solids, right? Liquids and solids are more tightly packed together. But with gases, the distance between those particles is so great that um, the, part, the actual size of the particles themselves is more or less negligible. And you can just use the volume of the entire container. The last one is that the molecules only interact through elastic collisions. And um, this obviously is not true as well, right? So um, when molecules come together, you know that there are certain Coulombic interactions, electrostatic interactions that happen between these particles. It's more than just an elastic collision between hard spheres. But from these three assumptions, we are able to get a kinetic model for an ideal gas. And it does give rise to the ideal gas equation, which I will show um, in just a second. But if you um, analyze this model, look at all the forces and calculate the pressure, you get the following equation for the pressure in this kinetic model. You'll get that P times V is going to be equal to one third the mass of the particle times N sub A. So I will um, note that as, oh, wait, no, just N. So N is just going to be the number of particles that are in the container. Um, and C squared. Now, uh, like I said, N is just your number of particles. So I'll write that here. These are the number of particles. And C is your root mean square velocity, right? So this is going to be your root mean square speed. And we'll show the equation for that in just a second for the root mean square speed. Um, and obviously this M is the mass of your particle. So this is the equation that you get from the kinetic model. And you can kind of see that it looks somewhat similar to our ideal gas equation. Eh, kind of, right? You got pressure times volume on the left-hand side. But everything on the right-hand side is more or less um, foreign to us as far as the ideal gas equation that we're familiar with, where PV is equal to nRT. Well, let's see how we get back to that relationship. So there are two uh, different definitions of kinetic energy that we can use to relate the, root, the uh, actual speed here um, to the kinetic energy, right? So we have a kinetic energy from classical physics, 
So we'll have a KE from classical physics, right? This is the one that you're more or less familiar with, right? Where the kinetic energy is just one half MV squared. And then we have a kinetic energy from statistical mechanics. Now, remember in the first video, we talked about that as being one of the branches of physical chemistry, statistical mechanics. So there is a uh, kinetic energy from STATMEC, which is a common abbreviation of statistical mechanics, STATMEC. And it's something called the equipartition theorem. And the way that it's defined, so it defines the kinetic energy as df, and this df is the degrees of freedom, so not a derivative, but the degrees of freedom, over 2 times k t, right? So like I said, this df, this is just the degrees of freedom. And K is the Boltzmann constant. This is the Boltzmann constant. Okay, so, uh, so we have these two equations for uh, kinetic energy, right? Now, let's say, for example, we have an ideal monatomic gas. So by that, I mean a single atom. So think about helium gas or argon gas, right? These gases that would, on a particle level, be composed of a single atom. Your degrees of freedom would be equal to three. And that just comes from your three uh, axes of translational motion, right? So if we consider this as our axis, right, we can have the particles moving in the x direction, in the y direction, or in the z direction. So this just comes from the XYZ translational motion that your particles uh, can have, right? Now, if we had a more complicated molecule, uh, we would have rotational um, or vibrational degrees of freedom. But to keep it simple, this would just be for a monatomic uh, gas, right? We have these three translational degrees of freedom. Now, our Boltzmann constant is actually related to, um, to the gas constant that we're familiar with from the ideal gas law. So the Boltzmann constant, K, is going to be equal to R over N sub A. This N sub A is Avogadro's number. So this is Avogadro's number. Right, so this is going to allow us to relate this back to the, uh, the total number of particles, right? So we have Boltzmann constant equals the gas constant over Avogadro's number, right? So now what I want to do, uh, now given this information, I want to set these two kinetic energy expressions equal to one another. So let's do that. So let's set the two Ke expressions equal right so we'll have one half mv squared on the left hand side what we get from um well and let me actually uh write this as c squared right so we're using our root mean square speed here so one half mc squared is going to be equal to three over two Right, just plugging in my degrees of freedom here. So we got three over two, and then plugging in this definition for uh, the Boltzmann constant, we'll have R over Avogadro's number, right, times T. Now, if we isolate C squared, then we get the following expression: we get three R T over M times Avogadro's number, right? And this is actually your equation for the root mean square uh, speed, right? So this is your RMS equation, right? Where you can actually calculate the root mean square velocity, right? Okay, so um, now that we have this, we have this expression for C squared. So let's plug this back in to our equation for uh, from the kinetic model. And then we'll see how we get down to the eventual ideal gas equation.
So I'm going to start on a new slide here. Right. So keep in mind that our equation from the kinetic model was PV is equal to one third M in C squared. Right, so I'm going to plug in what we just got for c squared, right? So I'm going to have one third m times n, right? And then just plug in what we get from four c squared. So we'll have three r t over m times Avogadro's number, right? Just plugging that guy in. We still got PV over here, right? So um, now that we have that, we'll see some things that algebraically cancel out, right? So let me get a different color to, to cancel this out, right? So we get the threes go away, right? We get the mass also cancels out, right? Mass there cancels out with mass here, right? So then uh, dropping all of that stuff down, we just end up with PV is equal to N over N sub A, right? Times RT. Right, and I'm going to kind of group these together, and hopefully you'll see um, specifically why I'm kind of grouping this quantity together. Right, uh, this should be familiar to you. Keep in mind that um, n, this capital n, is the total number of particles, and the, num the denominator is Avogadro's number. So when you divide the total number of particles by Avogadro's number. Remember, Avogadro's number is the number of particles in one mole. So this actually gives you the number of moles, right? So this guy is equal to n, the number of moles. And so when we drop that down, now we've got our good old familiar ideal gas equation, all from a kinetic model and some simple assumptions. We kind of get back to our full um, ideal gas equation. So kind of backing back up here, hopefully this gives you um, a good physical underpinning and understanding of the ideal gas law. Um, and not just from you know the standpoint of understanding the equation or understanding the fundamental simple gas laws, but understanding the, the physics behind what makes a gas behave ideally.